Hey guys, my name's Dale, and you're watching The Factoid. So when most people think of cloning, they think of taking the DNA from an organism and somehow using that to create a replica of the organism you're cloning. And in a sense, that could be true, but what's important to know is that the scientific definition doesn't always correspond with the cultural understanding for that word. As can be seen in the video I made about what is and isn't a berry. For in English, you could say that I am a clone of Bo Burnham, which you guys love to tell me. And the way we can interpret that in English and in the cultural sense, that can be considered true. But scientifically, that really doesn't hold any ground. I'm not actually a clone. I, I just don't see it, no. So, in biology, a clone can be understood as an organism that is created without the use of sex. And the different types of cloning I'm going to be listing for you guys are all considered natural since they occur naturally in nature. The first type of cloning is cloning that can be done through asexual reproduction, when offspring is created from a single parent using the exact same genetic code. Another type of cloning is called horticulture. And to oversimplify that, that is basically taking off a piece of a plant and caring for that severed piece until it gains the ability to sustain itself and grow independently and it shares the exact same DNA as the organism it came from, but is now independent from it and growing independently. And lastly and most interestingly, there's another form of cloning called parthenogenesis. This tends to be found in animals who have a hard time finding mates due to isolated populations, so their bodies have adapted ways to produce children without the need of a male. Literally having the female's egg, which would typically have half the woman's genetic code, having the full woman's genetic code, and then developing into an exact copy of the mother. Some animals that can do this are bees, boa constrictors, kimono dragons, even some breeds of mice and rabbits. Even though it's not the ideal way, it is a survival mechanism and could potentially make men completely irrelevant in the grand scheme of things, but could make pregnancy a lot less predictable. Now, identical twins are not considered clones. Even though they share a majority of their DNA, they don't quite fit the biological definition. But even if you were to look at identical twins, you can always typically find differences between them, whether it be their personality, sometimes height, and even their fingerprints. And what's interesting about that is if you were cloned, your clone would actually never have the same fingerprints as you. Being that genetics don't only determine your fingerprint. Other factors, such as the pressure within the womb, the position of the fetus, and ambitonic fluids all factor in as well. Meaning that if you were cloned and the exact environment wasn't also completely identical to when you were in the womb, your clone would actually not theoretically have the same fingerprints as you. Now isn't that interesting? Now let's talk about the cloning that this video is really about. The most famous, the most controversial, the most interesting, being biotechnical cloning, which in turn involves somatic cell nuclear transfer. Now for context, every cell in your body is a somatic cell which contains 46 chromosomes, meaning that your reproductive cells are not somatic cells. Reproductive cells contain only 23 chromosomes and are known as haploid cells. And when compatible haploid cells meet, they fuse together and in turn make an organism, and in this case a human, which would have 46 chromosomes. You're basically skipping over the fertilization part and putting a nucleus that already has all the chromosomes and has been already made prior into an egg cell to develop. So to explain how somatic cell nuclear transfer is done, let me show you with this animation. So for this example, I'm going to be using mammals, and more specifically llamas, because llamas are awesome. So, here we have two llam llamas. No, no. Sh show. So here we have two llamas. So first we need a host, or a surrogate mother, who obviously needs to be female. And then we'll need a llama, which will be the one that's cloned. The cloned llama can be either gender. So you then take an egg or a haploid cell from the host. You would then take a somatic cell from the part of the body of the llama that you're gonna be cloning. And in this case, we'll just use a skin cell for any cell will work for everyone that has all your chromosomes as a complete blueprint of your body. You would then take the nucleus out of the egg, the nucleus which contains only 50% of the host genetic material. You would then take the nucleus out of the somatic cell of the animal that you're gonna be cloning, which already contains all the necessary chromosomes. And then you insert the nucleus into the egg. After this, you give it a tiny jolt of electricity or just the right chemical combinations in order to trick the egg into thinking it was fertilized. Otherwise, nothing would happen. After the cells multiply for a few days, it can be placed back into the surrogate mother. And hopefully after a few months, you got a baby. It should also be noted that a clone will only develop in the womb. Meaning that you cannot get a clone to develop in a test tube or in a container. It has to be developing within the body of a compatible host. Otherwise, the cells will just keep dividing and eventually most likely die. You would then get a chorea, which is a baby llama, of the llama that you took the genetic material from. This is a clone produced by somatic cell nuclear transfer. Now that may sound quite simple, but the truth is, it's not really all that simple. There are three major points that have to be brought up when you're talking about cloning. The idea of how many trials it may take, the longevity of the clone itself, and the ethics behind it all. 
So in the case of trials, it could potentially take hundreds upon hundreds of different tries in order to get a single clone that is successfully produced. In the case of Dolly the Sheep, one of the first major well-known clones to ever be introduced to the world, that was produced back in 1996, took 277 different attempts in order to get at least one successful clone. Of the 277, only 29 survived long enough to be even placed into a surrogate sheep. And of the 29, only one lived after it was born. And that was Dolly. And it scares people for how many times may it take for you to get a successful clone, especially if you're talking about humans. And in the words of the great scientist Bill Nye the Science Guy, Cloning is a tricky business. Now if we have this much trouble with farm animals, are we really ready to try it with humans? Now longevity is one of the most important things to know, but most of the general population doesn't know it. So for an example, let's say you want to clone Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman is over 75 years old, meaning that every nucleus in all the cells in his body are also over 75 years old. For every single nucleus in all the cells in his body is an exact copy of the original nucleus that was made when he was first conceived. So for example, say a cell that was just created splits on the third day. Those two cells have a three day old nucleus. And say those two cells split again in another three days, all four cells now have a six day old nucleus. So the problem with this is if you're taking a 75 plus year old man and then taking the nucleus out of his cells to create an entirely new organism, organisms that are all formed by brand new nuclei, because in order to trick the cell to divide, you have to make the nucleus believe it is young, but it's not. And in the case of Dolly the sheep, Dolly was cloned from a sheep that was six years old. Meaning that all the cells in Dolly's body were six years old at the time she was conceived. Now it should be noted that sheep on average only live 12 years. And as you can probably guess, Dolly's health completely deteriorated and she died at the age of six. So if you're going to use elderly people and create new organisms out of their cells, chances are the offspring of that are not going to live very long. And scientists have absolutely no idea how we could actually make a nucleus younger. But this also means you can't clone dead organisms or people whose cells haven't been preserved and their bodies have been decomposing. But if it's frozen, like say mammoths for example, the decomposition was not able to happen. Meaning that we can actually take the cells and produce clones because the nucleus of the cells have not been damaged. Which is also the reason why we have frozen samples of sperm, eggs, and even skin of most extinct animals that we have been able to save in the past century. Tasmanian tigers being one of them. So this all leads up to the single and ethical question. Should we attempt to clone humans? And I'm not talking about organs here, but just humans for reproductive purposes. If you have a 40 year old man who can't produce children and he wants to use his cells, not only are you gonna produce a child that won't be able to produce like his father, that child's life will be dramatically cut in half most likely. And there can be a wide range of different health problems that can be attributed to this. So this then segues into the question, do you feel we should clone people for reproductive purposes solely? And with all that said, my name's Dale, you're watching The Factoid, and remember, never stop learning. Thank you. And cross a, a man if you like my videos, please stay in tune for more. An adult. More videos on the facts the that almost everybody missed. This is the love that works with reasoning, 